Welcome to our lecture on statistical inferences about the population proportion P. Remember way back when we talked about the central limit theorem and the sampling distribution of the sample mean? Well, sometimes we want to make inferences about other population parameters, and we have to know the sampling distribution. In this case, in this lecture, we're talking about the sample proportion as an estimator, or using it to make inferences about the population proportion. Uh, so we need to know something about the sampling distribution of a proportion. Um, it turns out, and we'll see more in the next slide, but uh, all we need to know at this point is that when n, the sample size, times p, the population proportion, and the complement, n times 1 minus p, if they're, as long as they're both at least 5, greater than or equal to 5, then the z distribution is a very, very good approximation to the sampling distribution of the proportion. Uh, therefore, we can use the, a formula for z uh, to convert the sample proportion, a random variable, to a z statistic. Um, Ps is what we're using to denote the sample proportion. P, capital P, is what we're using for the population proportion. And this is as good a time as any to note that depending on the book you're using or some other notes that you may be using, um, some people use other notations for the population proportion. Um, you may be using pi, the Greek letter pi, as the population parameter, the population proportion. Um, but we're going to be co consistently using capital P. So like all formulas for Z, when we're using a Z statistic, we take the random variable minus its expected value divided by its uh, standard deviation. Um, and you know we know this from um, those who studied the sampling distribution of a proportion. We're not going to study it very, very in, in very much in depth. You'll see a little hint of it on the next slide. But basically, the formula for converting to z is ps minus p divided by the square root of p, the population proportion, times 1 minus p divided by n. All of that is under the square root. And um, as always in the formula for z, what population parameter are we using? The one under the null hypothesis. So in this case, when we say we're taking PS, the sample proportion, minus P, well, we're using the sample proportion in order to make inferences about P. So we don't know P. We don't know the population proportion. But we're doing a hypothesis test. We have a hypothesis. And uh, that's the, the value of P that we use over here. Now let's look at the formula for um, a confidence interval estimator of P with uh, 1 minus alpha, for instance, maybe 90% or 95%. Uh, the sample statistic, like before, is smack in the middle of the interval. That's the sample proportion, PS. And then plus and minus the half width of the confidence interval. In other words, we take PS, add something on one side, add something to the other side, and that's our interval estimator for the population proportion, P. What do we use? First, we use a value from the z-table that gives us our level of confidence. And then we multiply by the measure of variation. And this time, under the square root sign, we have ps, the sample proportion, times 1 minus ps, divided by n. Um, so here's something to ponder. Take a minute and think about it. This is the first time you see the two formulas that are very, very similar, just sort of algebraically turned around. One for a hypothesis test, one for a confidence interval, and yet they use different values. The formula for z, for computing the z statistic, uses uh, the population parameter p under the null hypothesis. The formula for confidence interval estimator just uses the sample proportion. You don't see p anywhere in there. Why is that? 
Think about it for a minute. I'll give you 10 seconds. Now I'll give you the answer. Well, if we're doing confidence interval estimator, we're trying to estimate the population parameter. That means we are not making any assumptions about it. We have no claims. We have no hypotheses. We don't know anything. We don't even know enough to make a guess about P. All we have is the, the data from the sample. So we use the sample proportion all the way through. Okay, so here's what we were referring to before. Um, the sampling distribution of a proportion um, should be, uh, the proportion is binomial, uh, binomially distributed. It's two states, uh, there's success and not success, there's a probability of each, P and 1 minus T. Uh, that's a very, very, uh, very uh, obviously something that's going to follow the binomial distribution. However, you can see from the picture, as N gets large and N times P and N times 1 minus P, uh, get closer, uh, are, are greater than or equal to uh, 5, at least 5, the distribution gets approximately very, very close to a bell-shaped normal type of distribution. And the Z becomes a very, very good approximation uh, for the sampling distribution of a proportion. Okay, this is a good example to see when we use the test of proportion. A politician claims that 70%, whether he is, he sees a proportion, it's not a mean, 70% of the people in her district are Democrats. He wants to see if that's uh, true or not. So you take a sample, and we call it P little s, the sample, and the sample is 50 out of 100, which is 50%. Now the question is, is that 50% far enough away from the claim of 70%, it's a 20% difference, but it could be sampling error. Certainly, everyone in the class would agree. If I make a claim of 70%, so out of 100 people, if you'd have gotten 69, that's probably sampling error. So 71 or 68. But here it's 50 out of 100. So that's really what we're going to do. We're going to take the sample evidence, convert into a z-score, and then actually from the z-score we can see the probability. And we can see if it's less than 5% or not. Again, knowing what the z value, and you're familiar with this, 1.96, that between plus 1.96 and minus 1.96 in the z distribution will give you 95% of the area. So we have that little cushion. So we're willing to accept up to a certain point that it's sampling error. So a little bit of a deviation from the 70%, which means 70 out of 100 people, we would accept. A little bit off, we accept say sampling error. But if it's too far away, Let's say we're beyond minus 1.96, or beyond plus 1.96, then we will call you a liar, and we'll say the politician is lying. Well, the formula you have on the sheet, and we turn the sample evidence, but notice we're using the claim. You claim that P, the population proportion, is 0.70. We play devil's advocate. You're right. Let's say it is 0.70. So we put that into the formula, we have the 0.70 there, we look at the sample evidence, and now this will give us a, a probability in effect. So when we finish, we get a z-score of minus 4.36, that's definitely in the rejection region, and we know the probability of getting a z-score of minus 4.36 is a lot less than 5%. And you can figure it out, if you really want to figure out what is the probability, you can actually go from minus 4.36 to a negative infinity, see how much area you have then, double it, and you'll actually see what is the probability of getting this sample evidence if HO is true. But our conclusion is the politician is a liar. We shouldn't have seen, if they're claiming 70%, we shouldn't have gotten a sample of 50 out of 100. The P little s of 0.50 is too far away from 70%. Can't you conclude that the politician is a liar because her mouth is moving? Yeah, I think I would agree with that too. And now we're constructing a confidence interval. Now remember, with the confidence interval, you don't have any claims. You're just working with the sample evidence, which was 50 out of 100 or 0.50. So all we can work with is that 0.50. We use the same z-score for 95% confidence of 1.96. Remember, you use a plus and a minus on both sides. So we do 0.50 plus and minus the z-value of 1.96 times the square root of 0.50 times 0.50 over 100. And our uh, sampling error, or margin of error, if you want to call it that, the margin of error is 0.10. So our conclusion is we're 95% confident 
that somewhere in that range of 40% to 60%, remember 0.40 is 40%, and 0.60 is 60%, somewhere in that range of 40 to 60%, we have the true proportion of Democrats in this district. Well, you notice that will tell you right away that 70% is not reasonable. Neither is 30%. But up to 60% could be reasonable. Here's another problem, very similar to the previous one. You may even wish to uh, take a moment, stop the audio, uh, do the problem on your own first. But uh, for now, let's move on. A politician claims that exactly 90% of the American public favors legalizing drugs. A survey of 100 people shows that only 79 are in favor of drug legalization. Test that's alpha equal 0.05. Well, the first thing you do, just like any other hypothesis test, you need your null and alternate hypotheses, HO and H1. Um, HO is the claim. The claim is that uh, exactly 90% of the American public favors legalizing drugs. So HO is that claim, that P, the population proportion, is equal to 0.9. The alternate hypothesis, H1, is that it's not. Uh, if we reject HO, we don't really have to specify whether it's not because it was too large or not because it was too small. Either way, if we reject the null hypothesis, all we're saying is that 0.9 or 90% is wrong. From the data, we compute, I'm sorry, one more step first, uh, looking at the, um, the critical values from the Z distribution. Alpha is 0.05, we take that 0.05 and break it up equally into the two tails, because this is a two-tail test, we're going to reject. If we get, if we, if we find a value that's too high, uh, we're going to reject. If we find a value that's too low, um, 2.5% and 2.5%, but for that tail probability from the Z table with critical values of plus and minus 1.96. Um, the calculated value of Z we calculate from the data. The data tells us that 79% of the sample um, was in favor of drug legalization. So that's 0.79 minus 0.9. And uh, uh, we're using um, the uh, hypothesized uh, population proportion 0.9 in the denominator in the measure of variation. That's 0.9 times 0.1 divided by 100, all of that under a square root sign. So what you get is negative 0.11 in the numerator, 0.03 in the denominator, or uh, negative 3.67, which is way out on the left side in the region of rejection. And so we reject the null hypothesis um, at alpha equal 0.05p. We don't have p, we haven't computed it, but if we did, it would be way less than 0.05. Um, I just want to point out one more thing and take this opportunity. Remember always when you're doing these tests, you need four things. When you do a hypothesis test, you need four pieces. You need the hypotheses because you can't reject or not reject something that isn't there. You need the, the critical values from the distribution of the test statistic. You need the calculated value of the test statistic and you need your conclusion, reject or not. Uh, I'd like to do a problem about legalizing killing politicians who lie. Can that be the next problem? How about killing spouses? Part B is to construct a two sided ninety five percent confidence interval estimator for the population proportion. All this involves is putting numbers into the formula. Uh, the, the sample proportion, 0.79, smack in the middle, plus and minus um, the, uh, the margin of error, um, which turns out to be 0.08. And we end up with an interval from um, 0.71 to 0.87. Um, we have 95% confidence that this interval does contain the true population proportion of people who are in favor of legalizing, uh, murdering, uh, legalizing drugs. Just for the record, I'm not in favor of this law that my uh, wife wants to pass up, making it legal to kill spouses. I'm against that law. But in any event, here's a problem with defective widgets. And again, we've been doing um, 
you know, two, you know, two-tail tests before. We did two problems with two tail. Let's do one with one tail test. The company claims that no more than eight percent of its widgets are defective, and you know by now if you hear the word "no more." That's a clue. That's a clue. No more means it's going to be a one-tail test. All right. Now, no more than eight percent of its widgets. Now, you take a sample of a hundred. You know, ideally, it should be eight defectives. We found ten. Okay, it could be sampling error, or it could be uh, that the company's been lying. All right, so we have PS is 10 over 100 or 0.10. The claim was 8%. Now, we're, there are two parts to this problem. First, we're going to test the claim at an alpha of 05. And part B says, no claims are made. We just want to construct a 95% confidence interval, and it's two-sided. Well, here we're doing the hypothesis test. So HO is a P. Remember, capital P is the population proportion. Some books call it pi. We're calling it capital P. But it's less than... 0.08. Anything below a 0.08 is fine. Their claim was something less than 8%. No more than 8%. H1 is that P is more than 8%. Okay, we have the sample evidence, PS, that's the sample, is 10 out of 100 is 0.10. So using the formula for Z, now this is a one tail test, so the critical values on the right, remember the clue, H1 always points to where you put the critical value. If you put the full O5 on the right side, you have a critical value for Z of 1.645. All right, so now we convert the sample evidence into a Z-score, and we do 0 0.10 minus 0 0.08 over the square root of 0 0.08 times 0 0.92 over 100. That's the formula. And you get 0 0.020 over 0 0.027 or 0.74. So a Z-score, in effect, you've taken the sample evidence and you convert it all into a z-score of 0.74, notice it's not in the rejection region. It would have to be more than 1.645 to be in the rejection region. At the value of 2, 2.5, that's in the rejection region. 0.74 is not enough for us to reject your claim. So we can't reject HO, we don't reject it, because the problem of getting the sample evidence is more than 5%. So basically, the conclusion is that maybe the claim is accurate, and we're just looking at sampling error. 10 is not enough of a deviation from 8%. On the other hand, I think you wouldn't even need statistics for this. If I claim that 8 no more than 8% of my widgets are defective, and you took a sample of 100, and instead of finding no more than 8 out of 100, let's see if found 45 would be effective out of 100, I think you would all know that that would not be sampling error. How about all of it ever defective? 100 out of 100. You've got to be nuts to buy anything from this company. You certainly know that it's almost impossible to get that kind of sample evidence. Now here in Part B, we just no claims are made. All we have to work with is sample evidence. We know 10 out of 100 widgets made by this company are defective. So here we're using the Z value of 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval. And if you look at the... Um, we use 0.10 plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of 0 0.10 times 0.90 of 100. That whole term works out to on the, on the right of the plus or minus side, works out to 0.06. That's called the margin of error, the sampling error. It's the margin of error. So we know that somewhere between 0.10 plus 0.06, or 16%, 0.10 minus 0.06, 0.04%, somewhere between 4% and 16%, that's the, that's where you'll find the true population proportion of these actives. So somewhere, anywhere between 4 and 16%. Now, the obvious question is, we have a pretty wide interval here. What can we do to narrow it down? And that's the kind of thing that, even if you're not a statistician, you should know that the reason it's so wide is because you're working with a sample of 100. Maybe you should take a bigger sample. And that's one of the things we know, that if you take a larger sample, that will make your confidence interval narrower. Your margin of error won't be as large. Okay, this concludes what we call one sample test. We're working with one sample. Remember, we, you know, we looked at one sample test. And think of there's like three cases. One case where we can use the Z when you know sigma, or when N is quite large. Some books say... You know, have others, but we, our approach is if n is very large, we're going to use z. Or if you know sigma, the population standard deviation, you can use z. So large samples, we're going to use z. If the samples are small, and it doesn't matter what, how small is small, but when they tend to be small, we're going to use t. Remember, then we use the t, the t distribution. And if we're dealing with a proportion, 
And again, in this case, we work with a binomial proportion. We saw a couple of examples before where I say a certain percentage are Democrats or, or a certain percentage uh, are defective. When you're working with proportions, or let's say, say that, you know, at least, you know, uh, the 30 percent of the students who take statistics will fail. That's a joke because we don't expect 30 percent. But uh, things like that, then you're going to have to use the, the Z as an approximation of the binomial distribution. So we have three cases and all three have been covered. If you want a clue, a word clue, when you're looking at a problem um, and you want to know is this a, a mean problem or a proportion problem? Are we making inferences about the mean or the proportion? Uh, a very good clue is, does the problem tell you the standard deviation? Because as you saw from the formula, the, the standard deviation for the um, distribution of the proportion has the proportion built into it. You don't have a separate standard deviation. So here's a problem. You tell me what you'd be using. Let's say I say that uh, you know at least um, forty percent of students taking the CPA exam at uh, our college will pass. No, <laughs> you hear a percentage, right? It's got to be. There's only. I'm not giving you a standard deviation, and eventually, I just what I'll, what I'll give you is the numbers. I'll say you know forty out of a hundred, or some number like that. It's a problem involving proportions. On the other hand. If I say, talk about a score, if I say that uh, the, the uh, SAT scores at this college are, and I give you a mean and a standard deviation, then you're working with um, Z or T depending on the sample size.